The mystery man involved in BYU practice last week, the people have been wondering who he is. Well, we finally have some information exclusive here on Locked On Cougars. We'll also talk a little bit more about Pac-12 versus Big 12 expansion rumors. And, of course, BYU basketball, their first entrant into the NCAA transfer portal. Probably not who you thought it was. We'll get to all of it on today's show. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. We're always proud to be part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Of course, the motto is your team every day, and as such, we are your only daily podcast focused on all things BYU. Diving right in on today's show, I love when my information uh, apparently stands up with the national media. What I mean by that is, if any of you listen uh, to the Audible with Stuart Mandel and Bruce Feldman. They did a podcast yesterday, so that'd be Monday, wherein Max Olson, one of their compatriots over at The Athletic, spoke and uh, was speaking with them, I should say. And in the conversation, they were talking about Pac-12 uh, media rights, Big 12 expansion aspirations, the whole gamut, the, the whole storyline of what we've all been paying attention to. And as uh, Max mentioned in that podcast, he said the two schools most receptive to all of the Big 12 overtures, if you believe that those are actually happening, and I do believe they are happening because I've talked about them, uh, is that Arizona and Colorado are the most receptive to the overtures from the Big 12 conference. That falls right in line with what my compatriot over at the KSL Sports Zone PK has been saying. I've also independently verified it with some people I trust on the matter who have said that Arizona and Colorado would be the most likely of any of those Pac-12 schools to make the jump. Does that mean that uh, where there's smoke, there's fire, and it's an imminent move to see these guys uh, end up, not guys, see, see these programs end up joining the Big 12 and bolster in particular with Arizona, the basketball ranks? No, it's not an imminent deal, but the longer, as I, I don't, I'll continue to sound like a broken record on this. The longer this drags on with the Pac-12 not having a media right still locked in, the more and more you're going to hear people talking about this. Because guess what? People get antsy. People start to talk. People start to look around and try to find a, an exit ramp or a, a lifeboat, in essence, to save them should things turn south. Now, what I have also heard is of the four corner schools as they have become come to know, and I, I need to stop using it because I really just don't like the term, but nonetheless, uh, of those four schools, Utah and everything that I have heard, and Michelle Bodkin, another one of my compatriots over the kslsports.com side of things covering the Utes, uh, says that Utah is the most intent on sticking with the Pac-12. And that's also something I've heard is that the, the Utah has been rather obstinate uh, in terms of their willingness to listen to Pac-12 to, to the big 12 and they've been very adamant about wanting to stick it out in the pack. And I can understand that they've been a dominant force in that conference. And even if a program like Arizona and Colorado were to leave that thins the herd, I know I'm not saying that Arizona and Colorado are contenders by any means, but it just it thins the, the ranks in terms of your opportunity. Speaking of Utah to stay atop the conference. The only problem is you're already down to 10 schools. So if you were to lose a Colorado or an Arizona that drops you to eight schools, and that is not a viable option for a power five conference you'd have to backfill with potentially two and probably as many as four schools to join does that mean you're going out and suddenly you're welcoming boise state memphis smu rice uh obviously san diego state seems like the front runner out there you're backfilling with the dregs in many ways of what was considered to be the top tier of the g5 candidates to make the jump to the power five so very interesting times and like i said it's always good i'm i guess i'm some some self-aggrandizement over here on my end that uh max olson who is one of the foremost authorities when it comes to the covering the big 12 and college football nationally same thing with Stu and bruce they are saying that it's Arizona and Colorado the most receptive in terms of the overtures so far, but 
Let me also caution once again, these will continue to come out because the, the, I have not heard of anything happening on either side in terms of the Pac-12 uh, announcing a media right still imminently or also the Big 12 making the move that we all hope they would in terms of striking and uh, getting one or two or maybe potentially as four uh, schools out of the Pac-12. But uh, it looks like things are just the smoke's still there, folks. And the folk is gonna the smoke is gonna remain there. The fire will still remain remain lit until the Pac-12 either douses it or the Big 12 finally pulls off their chief aspiration that is to dismantle or at least cripple the Pac-12. Now, a couple other notes on the BYU football front side of things here, and just uh, just real quick is uh, that BYU football uh, continued practices yesterday in spring ball. The next media observation period will actually be tomorrow's practice. Uh, be in the evening and also Friday afternoon, we'll have an opportunity to get out to practice. So we'll have more for you guys on that front later on this week. But there was a kicker last week, uh, number 97, who made a field goal in their two-minute drills last week. And he's actually been seen in some pictures that BYU has put out uh, in terms of their photography. And on the rosters that were given out to the media and also online, there's not a 97 on the roster that's at least a kicker. And I've been uh, digging and talking to people, and I guess we'll call this an exclusive here on the on the podcast. And this this is a really a, I got to be frank. This is kind of a nothing burger, but it's just kind of a fun tidbit because uh, actually a few of you have reached out and asked, Jake, do you know who number 97 is? And other people have prognosticated who it might be on social media, et cetera. But I have it on good authority. The number 97 playing for BYU right now is a walk-on kicker during spring ball who made the first of two uh, made field goals during last Friday's practice is a guy by the name of Matthias Dunn. And I did a Google search on him. because He's a former prep star here in Utah, a guy that actually originally announced he was going to go to BYU all the way back in 2019. Who knows what the reasoning was for him uh, delaying in terms of joining the program until 2023. Uh, I did see on his social media, if it's the right social media, he was going on a mission, but I would have brought him back in, what, 21? So interesting, but all the same. uh, The mystery man, number 97, the kicker, as some of you might have been wondering about, his name is Matthias Dunn. And we'll see if he continues to uh, stick around with the program throughout the summer on into training camp. The biggest thing for me on the kicking side of things is day one of practice is absolutely horrendous. And Kalani Satak Okay, said as much. He he said that we struggled, but they have rebounded uh, to a, a decent degree. It feels like in succeeding practices. We'll see as that continues to progress. But the bigger thing I think for BYU kicker wise is they've been spoiled uh, with some very solid kickers of late. Obviously, Jake Oldroyd was the most recent one and decided to hang it up after last season. BYU right now has four different kickers competing for playing time, and I'll, I'll be honest. I don't have any confidence that any of them are going to be the guy game one against Sam Houston State. But I could be completely wrong about that. We'll see how it all shakes out. But a very interesting uh, tidbit there that uh, if you're looking, if if you were one of the folks wondering about that, Matthias Dunn is your man, the man who wears the mystery man who wears number 97 kicking for the BYU football program. All right, coming up here in just a moment, transfer portal is open. Uh, Crazy, crazy first day as we all expected on that front. Only one entrant from the BYU basketball program into the transfer portal. It's not the one many of you probably expected or maybe one of the ones that you did expect as a BYU basketball fan. And also, what does the transfer portal pretend for BYU's chances as they get ready for their first campaign in the Big 12? We'll talk about all of that in just a second. First, a word on our friends over at FanDuel. Of course, the midway point of the NBA has come and gone. We're now staring down the barrel of the NBA playoffs. March Madness starts later this week. Actually, we have first four games, or what are they calling it, the first round? I don't remember what they're calling them anymore. Those happen tonight and tomorrow night. But if you want to get in on that action, download the FanDuel Sports app. It's America's number one sports book. The best part is new customers can get a no-sweat first bet with a bonus bet back, or bonus bets back, I should say, plural, if your first bet does not win, my friends. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app today. It's safe, secure and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained along with a myriad of other betting options, both uh, prop bets, spread action, uh, money line. No matter what you're interested in, they've got it for you guys. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay if you want to increase the, I guess, the the sweat, I guess, in terms of your chances of winning. But nonetheless, don't miss it on your chance for your no sweat first bet from our friends at FanDuel right now by going to FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started there. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more now. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. 
Today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at UCCU, and it's the perfect time to open a low-rate home equity line of credit from our friends at UCCU. Over time, the value of your home goes up, and as you make payments, the balance that you owe goes down. That space in between is what they call equity, and it's yours. A UCCU home equity line of credit or a HELOC can put that equity to work for you, like finishing your basement or yard or raising your home's value or paying off higher interest loans and getting out of debt faster or even helping with a college or weddings or peace of mind just coming that you know that you have a low rate line of credit ready for whatever and when over uh, whatever excuse me ucc will also provide you with your very own home equity visa card giving you instant access to that equity if you already have a home equity line with another financial institution just refinance with uccu and save to learn more or start your application today visit uccu.com stop by any branch uh see them at uccu and remember love where you bank Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys making it a part of your repertoire. I want to encourage you guys, if you're getting ready for this week with the brackets, grab your bracket and go listen to Locked On College Basketball Bracket Breakdown with national analysis and insights from all of our local experts. The Locked On College Basketball Bracket Breakdown has everything you need to make your most informed decisions on your bracket and hopefully help you win your pools. Find the episode on Locked On College Basketball or wherever you get your podcast. It's also available on YouTube. All right, BYU basketball did not uh, make the postseason. They uh, did not get an opportunity to play in the NCAA tournament, obviously, falling in the West Coast Conference semifinals. And obviously, the NIT was not an option because BYU is so far down the list in terms of at-large candidates. So BYU's offseason has started. The NCAA transfer portal, which will be a 60-day window, uh, so beginning from yesterday, so March 12th, 60 60 days out. So essentially, it will take us into almost mid-May with the transfer portal being open for college basketball players to put their name into the portal and examine their options with regards to their future. A lot of people, uh, I thought actually BYU might see a little more action in the transfer portal, but only one entrant so far for BYU, and that is Chinese uh, walk-on Hao Dong. Uh, I think it's Hao Chun Dong is his uh, full name. Uh, but he was actually a subject of a really interesting tweet. I think it's from Jeff Goodman, maybe. He's out there saying that 173 players have already put their name in the transfer portal on the first day. And he said that, and he said that early, kind of early on in the evening. I, I would say conservatively, roughly 200 players 200 athletes on the men's basketball side of thing alone entered the transfer portal yesterday there are going to be upwards of a thousand potentially that end up entering the transfer portal and byu will be no exception to this uh robbie mccombs who's done a really really great job covering byu basketball for vanquish the foe he said he expects two to three uh more entrants uh from the byu basketball program now how dome doesn't affect the scholarship limit because he was a walk-on with the byu basketball program i think robbie He's referring to he thinks two to three scholarship players will exit the BYU basketball program. I think that those will come, and as he also has mentioned, after they have what they call their exit interviews with Mark Pope and the coaching staff. What those exit interviews usually consist of is the coaches sit down with each player and, and kind of review the season, how they played, where their goals were going into the year, how they performed relative to those expectations, where they need to improve, what they'd like to see them do in the offseason. And there's probably also a question, honestly, I, I, if I was a coach, if I was Mark Pope, Right up front, I'd be like, are you considering entering the transfer portal? And have a discussion about as to why they're considering that and then come to a consensus about what they're going to do. And it may not be, you may not come to a consensus. Honestly, as a BYU basketball program, you may never uh, come to a consensus uh, with the athletes in terms of what you'd like them to do versus what they're going to do. And that's okay. That is what is the, I guess, the quote-unquote God-given right now with the transfer portal to these athletes. Now, for some of you who are asking, uh, I had a couple people ask, and I forget what the name was. I apologize. I don't have it up in front of me. But the question was, if a player does enter the transfer portal and decides to come back, is the basketball program under any, um, what, are the, what are we trying to say? Are they any under any uh, requirement to take those athletes back? The way I understand it, they are not. In the case of Hao Dong, I don't expect that he'll be back with BYU. Maybe he is. But for the most part, a lot of coaches, if you're an athlete they have enjoyed having in the program and they they feel like you you'd be a welcome addition to the program, they will welcome you back and fit you in if they're if they're capable of doing so. In the case of a guy like Hao Dong, because he's a walk on with the BYU basketball program, I don't see if he were to decide to come back to BYU, barring him having just an absolute awful relationship with the coaching staff, that he might consider returning to the program. But for the time being, he is now out in the transfer portal and able to be contacted by various coaches from other programs and to look at all of his options. And he also vice versa can contact programs to gauge their interest in potentially adding him 
to their roster. But uh, the future for BYU basketball, I think, needs to be for Mark Pope in these exit interviews is to keep as many of the key guys, the core six, seven, eight guys that BYU relied on this year, keep as many of them in the fold. He has told uh, reporters on multiple occasions this year, he wants to get old and stay old. And that's kind of the old adage in college basketball. Have a, uh, the majority of your roster be juniors and seniors because traditionally that's when you win your most basketball games. And obviously that's harder to do in this day and age when athletes can wake up one morning and say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm transferring. I'm out. And they can leave. And it, it just thins out your roster. Mark Pope needs to focus on keeping guys like Dallin Hall, Richie Saunders, Fusini Triori. I think Jackson Robinson should absolutely be a guy BYU keeps uh, with the keeps with the program, if at all possible. Because I think if you keep that core together and have an opportunity to work with them this spring slash summer and on into the fall, getting ready for next season, going into the Big 12, you're going to be better served, in my mind, in that respect to go out and have a, a core of guys who understand what you're going about and how you're going about things. And also at the same time, maybe supplement here and there with a couple of guys in the transfer portal right now. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to give some props to Utah state. I know that the Aggies are a persona non grata here on the podcast. Cause they're one of BYU's rivals, but what Utah state has done, they've made the NCAA tournament for the second time in three years. Ryan Odom has used the transfer portal the way I think it should be used. He has taken a core of guys who are already on campus. Campus at Utah State, collected mostly by Craig Smith, and then supplemented that with guys he brought from UMBC, his former uh, program that he coached at, and also guys that he knew in the transfer portal. Taylor Funk, in particular, a guy from uh, was it St. Joe's is where he came from as a tr graduate transfer. What a home run addition to the BYU basketball program! And it's not to say that BYU didn't try and go out and do work in the transfer portal. They absolutely swung uh, for the fences in the transfer portal, but it just did not work out. Uh, uh, Mitch Harper did a really, really good piece on kind of the the look ahead for BYU in their future with regards to the Big 12. And I'm trying to find uh, the, the direct quote here from that article. If I can find it, I'll mention it. But the, the bigger point is, is that BYU has not been lollygagging and wasting time in the transfer portal. Mark Pope has gone out and tried to land big fish after big fish in the transfer portal. This past year, he brought in Rudy Williams. He brought in Noah Waterman. And I thought Rudy Williams was actually a pretty good player for BYU. Noah Waterman, I think the... Uh, the jury's still out on him. He's still got eligibility. If he were to stick with BYU, I think he could really ingratiate himself with the program and become a better part of it if he were to kind of focus on basketball. There have been some off-the-court uh, distractions for him that have, I think, pulled him away in terms of his focus on basketball, but he has got skills. But the thing is, BYU needs to keep that core intact. Guys like T Atiki Ali Atiki, yeah, he may not have the the – upside that some of us thought they would have but the bigger thing for BYU is that they need to continue to build the core or I guess build around the core of players that they have but also use the transfer portal more judiciously does that mean you don't take as many guys in the transfer portal? Yes, that's what I would advocate for. Do not turn over this roster if you're Mark Pope with 12 new guys as you did last season. Keep that core. Like I said the six, seven, eight guys that were BYU's core. If you can keep all those guys in the fold and then add a player here and there to supplement what you're looking for, a point guard, and in my mind, you absolutely need a big seven-footer uh, for BYU. And I guess I can add this in here. Uh, talking with some reliable sources on this, uh, BYU has had some contact with Fargo. Does AMAC. And many of you might know that name, a guy who was a star for UVU before transferring to Texas Tech. Uh, didn't play much this past season, but has re entered the transfer portal after the uh, firing of the head coach down there in Lubbock. BYU has at least made contact with AMAC. Does that mean that he ends up playing in Provo for Mark Pope? No way of knowing. And I would actually, I would say probably not. It's more likely that he doesn't play for BYU versus him actually ending up in Provo. But BYU is already starting to reach out to players, and I'm sure they will continue to do so. Like I said, there's nearly 200, if not more than that, by the time you're watching and or listening to this podcast, athletes that have gone into the transfer portal. There will be no shortage of guys for BYU to comb through film, make contact with, and see what they can do. But the, the bigger thing is, uh, I've, I said this on yesterday's show, I'll say it again. BYU cannot afford, in my mind, if, with how things are looking right now roster-wise going into the Big 12, to just wholesale change once again. Keep the core intact. There's a lot of young, uh, talented players in this BYU basketball program who were freshmen and sophomores. The hope is, is when they're sophomores and juniors next season, they will take yet another step, and you can keep that core together. And the continuity itself 
hopefully will yield better results for BYU basketball versus blowing it all up, telling everybody, you know what, go look for another program, and then going out into the portal and trying to just bring in pieces and, and jam square pegs into round holes once again. That has kind of been the problem the last two years for BYU is, yes, they have tried to get some big fish on the transfer portal scene that have been good players out of the programs. Yes, that has happened, but they have not landed enough of those players to make a difference. Rely on the core here. Let those guys be your baseline for any success you have in the Big 12 and then supplement it from there with the transfer portal if you find the right guys. Uh, I, like I said, I'd look at Utah State and how they've kind of gone about things and, and trust that Ryan Odom's philosophy is maybe a little more nuanced and a little better, in, at least right now on paper, than what BYU has been trying to do. But uh, like I said, Fardaz Amak has been contacted by BYU my money is still on him not uh, playing in Provo, but hey, he's a big man who would be like uh, almost like an ideal fit for BYU. Big, I think he's 6'11", 260 pounds, something that BYU absolutely will need in the Big 12. He's got experience playing in the Big 12 from this past year, and he just he overall would be a focal point of BYU's philosophy and offense in the Big 12, make just life a lot easier for guys like Fuseni Traore, Atiki Ala Atiki on down the list. And be very interesting to see where it all ultimately shakes out. But there's a 60-day window beginning yesterday that BYU players uh, can enter the portal and also BYU can uh, grab guys out of the portal. And that doesn't mean that you have to add guys in those 60 days. Let me be very uh, clear about that. Just a 60-day window to put your name into the portal. You can withdraw and or sign with a new program at any point uh, in that window or beyond it. But a lot of that work will be done over the next two months. All right, coming up here in just a moment, we'll catch up on all the other news out there in BYU sports. Got a couple of things on what's going on with BYU baseball today. They moved up their first pitch against their rival Utah uh, down at Miller Park. If you want to go out and watch that, we'll get to that. We'll also talk about yet another game and our look back at all 155 games the BYU football program played in their independent history. Yet another starring role for Taysom Hill. We'll get to that in just a second. First, a word on our friends over at Perry Homes. Whether you're looking for your first home or or you're ready to upgrade to your dream home, Perry Homes has a house for you, my friends. For 50 years, Perry Homes has been Utah's premier home builder with communities throughout the state. They have many op uh, communities, home designs, and price points to help meet your needs. The best part is they got beautiful communities in Davis, Salt Lake, Tooele, and Utah counties. And even in the south end of the state, they got multiple communities in Washington County near St. George if you want to get down to Red Rock Country. They offer over 50 ho uh, unique home designs from Ramblers to two stories and townhomes. They even offer generous financing incentives through their preferred lender as well if you want to get started with that. And if you're looking to move right now, they actually have what they call their quick move-in homes available if you're ready to make the move ASAP. So visit PerryHomesUtah.com to see what's new in Utah. Utah's finest neighborhoods. That's PerryHomesUtah.com. For 50 years, Utah has been coming home to Perry Homes. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Cannot thank you guys enough for your support of the podcast. All right. Now, a couple of the notes before we go on today's show. Uh, as BYU uh, continues to uh, get ready for their Big 12 era coming up, I, I think the, the interesting part will be how BYU handles a lot of their scheduling with regards to non-conference scheduling. And, I, and I, I, what I mean by that is BYU baseball has a home uh, a home game today against uh, Utah. And obviously they played this series over the past three or four years, not even longer than that, 12 years, where they play between three and four games annually and they try and split them home and away. But BYU and Utah are going to play today at three o'clock mountain time at Miller Park. They moved up from a five o'clock first pitch in anticipation of inclement weather uh, rolling into the Provo area. If you want to get out and uh, watch that, it's an opportunity to do so. It will be on the BYU TV app as well as BYU radio 107.9 FM. If you want to tune in to the radio call of that. But the, what I'm trying to say is that the, the philosophy for BYU baseball compared to BYU football and BYU basketball, I just don't think that BYU baseball has to change much. You can continue to play UV. You can continue to play Utah in those kind of midweek deals. You can play Utah Tech as well and have fun with that. But the, the, the level of difficulty, once again, in the Big 12 in baseball is similar to football and basketball, wherein you're going into one of the elite baseball conferences. There are annually multiple programs from the Big 12 who make it to the College World Series in Omaha. And BYU will be hard-pressed to make another uh, imprint on the Big 12 early on. But that's what you go out in there and play the games for. So I, I'm interested to see how things go. But like I said, if you want to watch BYU baseball today, it's a 3 o'clock matinee 
If you want to leave work a little bit early, get down there to Miller Park. I uh, would encourage you to do so. Also, we found out BYU women's basketball host Rice in the round of 64 in the Women's National Invitation Tournament. That'll be at the Marriott Center Friday night at 7 o'clock Mountain Time. Uh, the TV details, broadcast details have not been settled quite yet. Uh, Rice was 22-8 and eight, uh, during this past season as BYU was actually just sitting at 500 on the year. Uh, this is the first trip for BYU to the WNIT since 2017. Uh, they have made nine appearances appearances in the tournament, making it to the great eight in 2010, the third round three times in 2013, 2011, and 1982, and the second round in 2001. But a big opportunity for BYU to host Rice once again at the Marriott Center. If you're looking for some, something to do on Friday night, would encourage you to get out there and watch uh, Amber Whiting and the BYU women's basketball team at the Marriott Center. Tickets available, I think, now at BYUtickets.com. All right, final thing before we go on today's show, our look back at all 155 games in BYU football's history makes a stop on September 11th, 2014. Uh, BYU came off that thrilling uh, just blowout win over Texas in Austin, and just four days later, they welcomed the Houston Cougars uh, to Lavelle Edwards Stadium. BYU wore those uh, really cool uh, memorial helmets from 9-11. If you remember, the, the Stretch Y logo on the side had the American flag uh, decal with it. But Taysom Hill, yet again, third straight game of the season, just goes out there and was absolutely marvelous. He ended up passing for 200 yards with one touchdown against two interceptions. That was kind of the down side for his performance. But he also ran a hunt for 160 yards. So 360 total yards, two touchdowns total. He also had one on the ground. But Jamal Williams was very, very good in this game as well. It's kind of the guy that BYU, uh, we started to really see him emerge during the 2014 season. But Jamal Williams had 28 carries for 139 nine yards and two touchdowns for BYU in this win. And it was a back and forth affair. If you might recall, John O'Corn uh, passed for 307 yards and three touchdowns for, for Houston in this game. And they made BYU sweat. Obviously, a short week in preparation coming back from Texas to get ready to face off against the Houston Cougars made it tough on BYU. But uh, in the AP story, uh, Taysom Hill was quoted saying, my mindset is, whatever it takes. And that's exactly what Taysom Hill was. But the there was some fortuitous uh, language in this podcast. If Taysom Hill needs to take off running 26 times every game, so be it, as long as BYU is winning. Well, mm, just a couple games later, no, actually, I think the next game, actually, if I, if I recall correctly, yeah, next game, uh, we will talk about uh, what happened. I was doing two games out, excuse me. So it was a couple games later. We all knew what uh, would ultimately transpire in the 2014 season, but Taysom Hill was off to just an absolutely insane start to the season. And it just looked like BYU was absolutely rocking and rolling. They entered this game, uh, finally ranked 25th in the country after that blowout win over Texas. When you improve to 3-0, and you'll move up in the national rankings once again. Houston sunk to 1-2 and on the year, but just a marvelous win for BYU, especially led by what Taysom Hill was doing. And the, the crazy thing about this was BYU uh, just – when it came to this season, the 2014 season, it's one of the seasons during independence that they're the great what ifs of BYU's independent era. And this Houston game in the first three games of the 2014 season, what Taysom Hill was doing uh, in those matchups makes you think, had he stayed healthy that entire year, what BYU might have accomplished. But like I said, we'll, we'll chronicle how, how things kind of played out for BYU. But coming up on tomorrow's show, we'll talk about a fourth straight win as BYU took on Virginia looking for revenge for that loss to open the 2013 season. They welcomed the Virginia uh, to Provo on September 20th, uh, uh, 10 days later, against the Cavaliers. We'll talk about that one on tomorrow's podcast. All right, so there you go. You are up to speed on everything going on in BYU sports at the moment. Like I said, the next media observation for practice for BYU football will be tomorrow. I'll, of course, be reaching out to our practice insider, seeing what I can find out for you guys, our listeners out there, of course, keeping you guys up to speed on everything going on with BYU. And once again, Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Now I want to encourage you guys to make your second listen, our friends over at the Locked On Big 12 podcast. It's a great way to get caught up on everything going on in the Big 12 conference, conference realignment, the NCAA tournament, no matter what it is, they've got you covered top to bottom. Check that out on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. So until tomorrow, my friends, have a great rest of your day. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. See ya.